Mississippi. When I was at junior school in the 1960s, every morning I had to sing hymns. Had to. And sometimes to ease the boredom I might go, but then the teacher at the side of the room would somehow know and come stomping down my line and go, sing! So you'd have to join in. Oh Lord God who made everything, we're just crap compared to you. I don't know how you put up with us, we're not even grateful, we deserve a good idea. The man who made it possible for us to sing these hymns, but not believe a word of them, was Charles Darwin. Yet what most of us are taught about Darwin comes down to one phrase, survival of the fittest, the philosophy of the Conservative Party. Which is why these people argue that it's natural that the country should be run by the strongest, fittest and most powerful specimens. In this programme, I'll be arguing that what these people mean by survival of the fittest is the very opposite of what Darwin believed. As well as those who misinterpret him, there are huge numbers of people who vehemently oppose Darwin's ideas altogether. In 1997, an opinion poll found that 44% of Americans believe that God created man within the last 10,000 years or so. And in 2002, Tony Blair gave his backing to a creationist school in Gateshead. Well, that place is especially worrying, because they're Geordie creationists, liable to grab any supporters of Darwin and go, Are you calling me a chimpanzee, you soft evolutionist punts? But in 1809, when Darwin was born, belief in the account of creation given in the book of Genesis was almost universal. The most literal creationists believe that two great events shaped the earth, the creation itself and then the flood, when, according to chapter 6 of Genesis, The Lord saw... How great man's wickedness on earth had become. And the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth. Men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and the birds of the air. For I am grieved that I have made them. Which was a bit rough on the other animals, wasn't it? They must have been thinking, why take it out on us, you vicious sod? We can't help it if man's wicked, we're starfish. So most people at the time believed that the earth was only a few thousand years old. A vice-chancellor of Cambridge University made a pronouncement that Man was created by the Trinity on October the 23rd, 4004 BC, at 9 o'clock in the morning. I suppose that's so when God finished he could go, Ah, just in time for Kilroy. There was a social reason for believing in the creation story. In feudal society it fitted the picture of a universe in which everything and everyone had their God-given place. Most importantly in this picture, nothing ever changed. In 1744, the German biologist Albrecht von Haller claimed that all generations of mankind were unfolding one by one like a Russian doll, having originally been contained in Eve's ovaries. What must that have looked like in the 16-week scan? Here is the man. I weiß doch noch vom letzten Mal, dass ich nüchtern herkommen muss. Dann sammelt sich hier Blut. Das ist ein Blutkoage. Die anderen Organe sind soweit unauffällig. Ja. Mm. Haben alle deinen Schlauch schon schlucken müssen. By the 19th century, with rapid changes in travel and technology and science, belief in the Bible's version of creation was being undermined. And this was accelerated by the discovery of fossils of animals that no longer existed. So some people suggested that God may have staged more than one creation, occasionally making a few creatures extinct. This theory of a series of creations became the orthodox view in scientific circles in the 1800s, particularly with a Dr McCulloch, who argued that if you studied the fossils of extinct animals closely, you could see that their noses are elevated as a result of them trying to keep breathing during the flood. And I bet some people went, oh yeah, look at that. I reckon you could say, and with these ones, you can see from the position of the front legs that they were trying to attract the attention of the Coast Guard, and some people believe it. 
The most influential radical in natural history at this time was Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. He'd written about evolution before Darwin had even been born. In Lamarck's theory, creatures could change themselves through their own habits. So, for example, a giraffe, by stretching to reach tall trees for food, could lengthen its own neck. This would then transfer to its genes so that it would pass on the slightly longer neck to its offspring. Then, after several generations, giraffes would have the length of neck they needed. In other words, he imagined the first long-necked giraffe saying to the other ones, Oh, graph, mate, that's how I got this, eh? Getting up at half past five every morning, doing two hours neck stretching before a ten-hour shift at a banana tree. If Lamarck and his disciples were right, it meant that creatures could change without God's intervention, which might be why the old Etonian keeper of shells at the British Museum said, Lamarck and his disciples vomit abominable trash, almost blasphemous and encouraging imbecility. Charles Robert Darwin was born in 1809 on the same day as Abraham Lincoln in the house that is now the Valuation Office in Shrewsbury. He was brought up in a wealthy medical family, was privately educated and then went on to Edinburgh to study medicine but he hated his studies and ended up leaving without a degree. A professor got Darwin a job on the five-year voyage of the HMS Beagle but it's a myth that Darwin's role on the ship was to be the naturalist. The captain, Robert Fitzroy, employed Darwin because he wanted somebody to talk to on the five-year voyage and etiquette in the Navy demanded that the captain should never converse with the crew as they were too lower class. Maybe the Navy was worried that being lower class was contagious and could be caught by naval officers. Fitzroy also had a second reason for wanting a companion. He was paranoid that he might end up committing suicide. The previous captain of the Beagle had gone mad and shot himself, and Fitzroy's uncle had been Castlereagh. The Tory Foreign Secretary, who'd also gone mad and slit his own throat, and now Fitzroy believed that he might have inherited his uncle's suicide gene. So with a five-year voyage to negotiate, Fitzroy invited Darwin onto the Beagle as someone of a sufficient social standing that he could talk to. To start with, Darwin and Fitzroy got on fine, and Darwin eventually took over from the ship's previous naturalist, McCormick, who got the hump and went home. After a while, though, tension grew between the two as they began to talk about politics. At one point, Darwin said to Fitzroy, One of you Tories should be put in pickle as a specimen. As soon you will be as rare as the rarest fungi. And in evolutionary terms, 160 years does count as quite soon. One night, Darwin and Fitzroy had a row about slavery, Fitzroy being in favour, whereas Darwin wrote, It makes one's blood boil and heart tremble to think that we Englishmen have been and are so guilty. After that, they ate in separate quarters. Twenty years later, Fitzroy learnt that Darwin had worked out his theories on evolution from discoveries he'd made while on the Beagle. Fitzroy was racked with guilt at his own role. If he'd never employed Darwin, the world might have been spared the abomination of evolution. He ended up running around, waving a Bible, shouting, This is the truth! This is the truth! And in the end, the guilt drove him so mad that he slit his own throat. On the voyage of the Beagle, Darwin collected thousands of specimens and bones and fossils, but it was the Galapagos Islands in the Pacific Ocean that made the greatest impression on him. While there, he noticed that on each of the many islands, the giant tortoises were different. The other thing he discovered about the tortoises there was they carried a lot of water in their bladder, which enabled them to crawl about for long periods in the dry interior of the island. So one day, the locals demonstrated to Darwin how, if they were thirsty, they would cut open the tortoise and drink the urine, which Darwin described as having... Only a slightly bitter taste. Eventually, he studied the dozens of samples of finches that he'd collected from the Galapagos Islands. Like the tortoises, each species was slightly different depending on which island it had come from. If God had created every species, why would he bother to create a different one for every island? And he wondered about the creatures he'd collected with a net from deep in the sea near Tenerife, and wondered why, if God had only created creatures like this as objects of food or beauty for mankind, did he put things where no one was ever going to see them? For God to have spent a vast amount of time and resources making creatures in the middle of the ocean would make no more sense than if someone said, let's spend billions on a giant dome and stick it on some wasteland in Greenwich. At one point, Darwin said, 
I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have bothered to design the parasitic wasp. 